die in in hospital sketches like Friedrich, like the German soldier. There's a gentleman who is mortally wounded that they make a reference to, and I think his name is Dan. And he comes up periodically in, uh, sco among scholars. And there is a Prussian. Um, he is helpful, very, very helpful to her when she runs into a problem with a delirious patient. And, um, and he comes up a, a couple of times, but he doesn't factor in as powerfully as the mortally wounded soldier who passes. Yes. So, um, yeah, I kind of wonder. I don't. There's a lot of things that when you read it, you will be able to see. Oh, here's a name, or here's um, a phrase, or you know, they will you will recognize them because they show up later in Little Women, mm. and you can see the influence of even her own writing on Little Women, beginning with hospital sketches. I believe the the soldier she was nursing it was actually based on a real soldier who Louisa May Alcott took care of yes yeah one of those Friedrich Bear prototypes I believe if I can manage the young one I can the old one muttered Cho as she walked away leaving Laurie bent over on a, a rail, railroad map with his head propped up on both hands Come in, and Mr. Lawrence's gruff voice sounded gruffer than ever as Joe tapped at his door. It's only me, sir. Come to return a book, she said blandly as she entered. Want any more? asked the old gentleman, looking grim and vexed, but trying not to show it. Yes, please. I like the old Sam so well. I think I'll try the second volume, returned Joe, hoping to propitiate him by accepting a second dose of Boswell's Johnson, as he had recommended that lively work. The shaggy eyebrows unbent a little, as he rolled the steps to toward the shelf where the Johnsonian literature was placed. Joe skipped up and sitting on the top step, affected to be searching for her book, but was really wondering how best to introduce the dangerous objects of her visit. Mr. Lawrence seemed to suspect that something was brewing in her mind, for after taking several brisk turns about the room, he faced round on her, speaking so abruptly that Rasselas tumbled face downward on the floor. What has that boy been about? Don't try to shield him now. I know he has been in mischief. By the way, he acted when he came home. I can't get a word from him. And when I threatened to shake the truth out of him, he brought it upstairs and locked himself into his room. He did do wrong, but we forgave him. And all promised not to say a word to anyone, began Joe reluctantly. That won't do. He shall not shelter himself behind a promise from you soft-hearted girls. If he's done anything amiss, he shall confess, beg a pardon, and be punished. Out with it, Joe. I won't be kept in the dark. Mr. Lawrence looked so alarming and spoke so sharply that Jo would have gladly run away if she could, but she was perched aloft on the steps, and he stood at the foot, a lion in the path, so she had to stay and brave it out. Indeed, sir, I cannot tell. Mother forbade it. Lori has confessed, asked pardon, and been punished quite enough. We don't keep silence to shield him, but someone else. And it will make more trouble if you interfere. Please don't. It was partly my fault. But it's all right now, so let's forget it and talk about the Rambler for something pleasant. Hang the Rambler. Come down and give me your word that this harem scarum boy of mine hasn't done anything ungrateful or impertinent. If he has, after all your kindness to him, I'll thrash him with my own hands. The threat sounded awful, but did not alarm Joe for she knew the irascible old gentleman would never lift a finger against his grandson, whatever he might say to the contrary. She obediently descended and made as light of the prank as she could without betraying Meg or forgetting the truth. See, there you go, right? 
he's his threats are are <laughs> they don't mean anything. I'm surprised he shook he shook him. <laughs> yeah, they go to deaf ears. <laughs> yes, he gets he he understands Lori very well, but he's. Well, he's a grandfather. He's not his, his a parent. And there's a lot of history between that, that that was there that had nothing to do with Lori, but it's connected to Lori, you know? And, you know, whatever else he may be going through, whatever his emotions may be, we only really learn of them through Marmy. And it, and it only comes up maybe once or twice, kind of in passing. So, I mean, there's a piece of fan fiction for you. Mr. <laughs> Lawrence. <laughs> I think he's kind of trying to build a relationship with him, but he he's not very successful, at least in the beginning. Laurie doesn't really know his grandfather when he moves to Concord. Like, they have been living together only for a while now. And we don't know if he went to see him when he was living in Europe. And somebody commented once that if this prank that Laurie made would have gone out and then people would talk that John was actually courting Meg, it might have um, had a very negative impact on John. He might have been fired and Meg might have lost her reputation because she was 17. I had never thought of that. Yeah, it's interesting to think about because people kind of expect Meg to marry a rich man. Joe even harbors an idea in her mind that at one time that Laurie and Meg would hook up. But she does that again with Beth. Yes. She's always hooking everybody up with, with Laurie except for herself. That's because she wants Laurie to be her brother. Yes, yes. <laughs> it was interesting because somebody asked me about this, like, isn't that like contradicting to Joe, Joe's character? Why would Louisa May Alka do that? But then I was thinking, well, if she really had this incredible maternal feelings for all the boys in the world, I don't think she necessarily saw anything wrong with that. Joe trying, wanting to marry Laurie to any one of her sisters, except herself. Exactly. It would just automatically make him the brother she already wants him to be. It solves the problem. And maybe it's because we are seeing these movie versions where Joe and Laurie are so romanticized. And maybe it's also because of our culture, really, that we, oh, like a... When I first read the book, or the first times, and I thought it was a bit weird that Joe wanted Mary Laurie to Meg, and but now I wonder maybe it was really something that Louisa May Alcott didn't see any. There wasn't any problem problems for her if she really felt that for boys, and I think she did. I once read from one of her biographies that when she had this fling with Larry Wisniewski. They really did pranks together, like they loved pranking people, and <laughs> and that just Joe and Laurie type of thing to do. I can't see anything romantic there, but it's one of those things that people just like to ignore. Yes, I've never uh, found in any uh, romantic literature a hero and heroine linked together through pranking. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it doesn't exist. Maybe it's just Joe and Laurie. Yeah, that's it. And, you know, I think maybe, too, now that we're discussing it a little bit more, I, that the difference in tone or mood between the first half and the second half of the book, um, the second half is is such a stark contrast as far as uh, lightness and, en and ener energy and there's still wit and her writing style is still lively but it's it's harder it's sadder 
gets darker. You know, they're older. And so um, people definitely gravitate more toward the first half of the book and that relationship. They just can't let it go. Yes, and it's interesting because one of my friends said this, that you know, she read the book after seeing the 2019 film and then she was surprised because in this first part there's nothing romantic between Joe and Laurie and she was expecting things to be romantic because Greta Gerwig said so. But we know that Greta Gerwig lied to people. So none of that exists here. I, I think a lot of the movies, they kind of set, us, set people to disappointment when they want to romanticize Joe and Laurie because there really isn't anything romantic between them. No, and I'd really like Greta to kind of point out any passage that suggests that. I don't think that she'll be able to do it. No. She also said that Joe hated Germans or Louisa Mayalcott hated Germans. Yeah, another lie. None of that ever happens. Well, that's just out-and-out propaganda. <laughs> I agree. And it's just these contradictory, contradictory things that she said that never happens in the book. So I'm not surprised that people have such weird views about Little Woman because I don't think most people who write adaptations have actually read it. Nor do, nor did people of that time wear Uggs in the snow. I actually read from letters that Louisa Mel wrote with Maggie Lukens, the Lukens sisters. You know that one? No. Well, they were like fans of her books. So they, the sisters, they had this letter exchange with Louisa May Alcott. And I read some of them and they were really interesting because the girls were like, we were heartbroken that Joe rejected Laurie and we were sad to see her grow and stuff like that. And then Louisa May Alcott answered, why is it that people think that Joe remains as a child when in the end of the book she's 30? And I thought that was interesting because people are so obsessed with Joe staying this teenager who, in my opinion, is not really a smart or admirable person, especially in this chapter. Little Woman Part 2 is really underappreciated because of that. People are so hanged on into things that I don't think are very admirable in the end. And that's the whole point of the first half, isn't it? Even the second half is that they're full of faults. Those are their burdens. The burdens they carry um, in their own pilgrims, pilgrimage to adulthood is that they have these faults. And I think if Lori had been a part of um, that whole pilgrimage, if he was as aware of it, um, then maybe he could his burdens could have included well I'm spoiled um, I am it's easy for me to feel uh, slighted I take offense easily uh, among other things that I'm sure you could add a number of things that would be put into his knapsack as his burden. But we don't have that experience of it being spelled out for us the way that we do for Meg, Joe, Beth, and Amy. And so we kind of have to do the work and put that together with all the clues that she leaves us because we have to be a little more astute in our reading to understand Lori's own arc. But it's all here. Because I have this distinguished memory of reading this chapter when I was 17. And I was mad for him for months, maybe years, <laughs> because of this chapter. <laughs> but it, it's, it was also because I was 17 at the time and I would very, very much relate to Meg. But it was much later when I read the book again and I started to see, oh, he actually grows out of this. Definitely, I had some resentment against Laurie at the time. 
when I have been speaking about this chapter in the podcast, I've had a lot of people saying that, oh yeah, when, when they read this part, it was weird for them how people could call Jo as a feminist because she doesn't really react in the way they want her to react. But that's really the whole point of the book because Jo really grows to become a feminist in later novels. And we have characters like Friedrich and her mother who help her to become that person. Yes, and they and Marmy also has Lori pretty pegged. She's fully aware. She she refers to him as a a weathercock and recognizes that he's pretty immature. And she stops up though and she is a a good influence upon him. He would probably and did, I think, accept well, obviously, as this chapter shows us, you know, he doesn't shake Marmy or go stomping off before she finishes telling him off in their private conversation. He he becomes contrite. He thinks about it. She does a lot for him. This family is very important to Lori and is an integral part of his maturation process. I think without them, he would have been just lost. He would have become like the king boy who gambled away the family's money that's, or or some of the family's money anyway. The king boy that was a member of the family that Meg is a governess to. Laurie sees mommy as, oh, like a a surrogate mother, but I think it's also, he doesn't stand against Marmy because I think deep down inside he knows that Marmy is actually the healthy mother figure for him because she can put those boundaries that even his grandfather can't put on him. And she's like also the one of those people who says no to him. Yeah. She points out to him, you know, you did wrong here, bud. And he has to take it. Well, he doesn't have to, but he does. To the best of his ability, I mean, as we read, we can see that he's still, oh, you know, vacillating. <laughs> yes. Hmm, huh. Well, if the boy held his tongue because he'd promised and not from obstinacy, I'll forgive him. He's a stubborn fellow and hard to manage, said Mr. Lawrence, rubbing up his hair, till it looked as if he'd been out in a gale and smoothing the frown from his brow with an air of relief. So am I, but a kind word will govern me, when all the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't, said Jo, trying to say a kind word for her friend, who seemed to get out of one scrape only to fall into another. You think I am too kind to him, hey? was the sharp answer. Oh dear, no sir, you are rather too kind sometimes. And then, just a trifle hasty when he tries your patience. Don't you think you are? Joe was determined to have it out now, and tried to look quite placid. She quaked a little after her bold speech, to her great relief and surprise, the old gentleman only threw his spectacles on the table with a rattle and exclaimed, frankly, You are right, girl. I am. I love the boy, but he tries my patience past bearing, and I don't know how it will end, and if we go on so. I'll tell you, he ran away. Joe was sorry for that speech the minute it was made. She meant to warn him that Laurie would not bear much restraint and hoped he would be more forbearing with the lad. Mr. Lawrence's ruddy face changed suddenly, and he sat down with a troubled glance at the picture of a handsome man which hung over his table. It was Laurie's father who had run away in his youth and married against the imperious old man's will. Joe fancied he remembered and regretted the past, and she wished she had held her tongue. He won't do it unless he is very much worried and only threatens it sometimes when he gets tired of studying. I often think I should like to, especially since my hair was cut. So, 
If you ever miss us, you may advertise for two boys and look among the ships bound for India. She laughed as she spoke, and Mr. Lawrence looked relieved, evidently taking the whole as a joke. You hussy, how dare you talk in that way? Where is your respect for me and your proper up and your proper bringing up? Bless the boys and girls, what torments they are, yet we can't do without them, he said, pinching her cheeks good humoredly. Go and bring that boy down to his dinner. Tell him it's all right, and advise him not to put on tragedy airs with his grandfather. I won't bear it. He won't come, sir. He feels badly because you didn't believe him when he said he couldn't tell. I think the shaking hurt his feelings very much. Joe tried to look pathetic, but must have failed, for Mr. Lawrence began to laugh, and she knew the day it was won. Is it Mr. Lawrence like a businessman who owns like cargo ships that take stuff to India and other parts of the world? So Larry basically could travel to India with Joe <laughs> in a ship, <laughs> but they are way too young to do that. And honestly, I don't think Joe even would like to go. She's so family oriented, you know, no matter how tempting an offer may be, the minute she remembers family, 